My name's Chris Gallivan. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Law here at Canterbury University. It's my pleasure to be able to welcome you here tonight. Thank you for braving the cold. This is the time of the year that students don't turn up to lectures, so it's always nice to um, have an abundance of willing participants to come along and hear me rant. Uh, so we're going to talk about understanding the law tonight, which sounds an incredibly broad topic, and I've narrowed it down for those people who have looked into it a little bit more as to what I'm going to talk about tonight. You'll know that I've narrowed it down into to criminal justice. It's quite topical at the moment, uh, and there is a number of cases that give us ample fodder to really get stuck into some nitty-gritty questions, um, which I hope to address tonight, and then by the end of the talk, open it up for questions. So I'm not sure how many people have come here with legal issues, but I'm sure that at the end of the time, We'll be able to uh, we'll be able to, to air those and, uh, and and talk about them and perhaps give you some legal legal advice. Don't just don't say anything to the police until you see your lawyer. That's my that's the that's the advice I always give my students. Um, a few house, housekeeping things. First of all, in the case of an emergency, there are exits, of course. Most of you come through the front door. There is actually an exit right up the back as well. Uh, and uh, we will, in an orderly uh, manner, will proceed out of the building. And if you go th out these doors to your left, uh, and of course this is exactly where you come out with the back entrance, and then the UC staff will take you to the holding position, which is actually in the car park, the um, Islam car park. Um, and uh, in the case of an earthquake, where now this is, I think, what we're now meant to do after we've changed it over a number of years, we're meant to stay still, hold, cover if we can, wait till the shaking stops, and then again in an orderly manner, fo ma um, manner follow the UC staff out to the um, to the to the to the area where we will be whisked away. Okay, so um, let's get started. What the hell is going on with our criminal justice system? Right? It's going to hell in a handbasket, isn't it? Judges are all part of some secret mason society with their funny handshakes and, and they have regular brain, brain explosions and not sending people to prison or sending, occasionally sending people to prison who don't need to be. But more often than not, they're just you know, giving people a, a slap over the wrists with a wet bus ticket when they actually deserve to spend the rest of their life in prison. Lawyers are all just out for money, of course, and they're fleecing their clients. Uh, there's criminals walking all over the place and just committing heinous acts of criminal activity in, the, uh, in around the public. We're not safe in our own homes, and it's all my fault. <laughs> Some of you might recognise that because that's the sort of the tenor of many of the emails that I get uh, in my inbox. Uh, it's sort of extolling what they see to be, these people see to be the problems or the ills of our society and our criminal justice system. And I tell you what, it actually is actually hard to um, say to those people who might tend towards a good conspiracy theory, and come on, let's be honest, we all like a good conspiracy theory. I love a good conspiracy theory as much as anybody else. But it's hard to actually say to them, no, 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 we're all okay. We're all okay. The system's fine, and it's working, it's working all right, just save for, save for a few sort of uh, speed bumps or hiccups along the way. Because actually, at the moment, we've got a hell of a lot of cases that will cause, and do cause us some concern, uh, both for the activity of investigators, the police more often than not, but not always the police, let alone the processes of the courts themselves, let alone once you're getting through into, into uh, sentencing. So if you are a person who is inclined to think that the system is rotten from the core, I'm not going to deny that there aren't some uh, cases and some incidences of which you can hang your hat on. As extreme as I think um, any sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater sort of arguments are that um, I've, just, I've just covered. So what if people could understand the law? It wasn't until after I did this, and I'm glad there's a lot of people who have turned up. Well, I'm sort of glad there's a lot of people turned up because uh, after I wrote um, this, the title, I thought, how patronising. This sounds really condescending, doesn't it? The only problem with the system is that you people don't understand it. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you exactly how it works. And once you, you know, I'll give, you, give me 45 minutes and you'll all work out and you'll just be as happy as Larry and know there's nothing wrong with the system. Well, not, not quite, not quite. I didn't mean for the heading to sound quite so condescending. And in fact, I believe that there are some real problems with the system that um, we need to focus our attention on. So, an overview. Well, we, I've, in a moment I'll talk about what my main thesis and the themes are, and then we'll run through some key concepts. Um, the extent of the, of the uh, problem is something that I think we need to really 
um, clearly understand. There's no point, especially in sort of academia and in a scholarly way, in an intelligent way, for us to try and deal with um, an issue, uh, to solve an issue if we don't know what the issue is, if we don't know what the problem is. Uh, and so I've sort of sketched out in a very broad and general way what we might think the problem is. And actually, just even a few minutes before walking through the door, I wrote down a, a few cases that we might have some problems with over the last 10 years or so. Um, the Rex Haig case, the David Doherty case, the David Bain case, the David Tamahiri case, an abundance of Davids here. If you're a David, then just... Uh, <laughs> if you're sitting next to a David, I suggest you move one along. Um, the Peter Ellis case, the Scott Watson case, the Makaiti Okotopa or Michael October case, the Tainapura case, the Lundy case. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's probably... Uh, he's filed an appeal now. It'd be interesting to see what the basis of that appeal is. I dare say it's all about the scientific evidence. We can talk a bit about that in question time if you like, and hopefully we might be able to draw some parallels from many of these cases as we go through. But they're not the only ones. There's the Uruweta 11 that were the Uruweta 11, then ended up being the Uruweta 4, because what did the police do? They went and bloody nailed and tied surveillance cameras on trees in the Uruweta ranges, when not only did they um, the sort of, uh, uh, were dubious as to the legal grounds for doing it, they knew they didn't have authority to do that, but they just thought the ends justify the means, and these are bad people doing nasty things, so we're actually justified in taking whatever action we need to in order to be able to stop these bad people doing these, doing these things. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people in New Zealand who think like that. Um, I don't think like that, and I think that's fundamentally flawed reasoning. And if we want to say we live in some civilised society that isn't merely a house of cards, which it probably is, then let's not start pulling cards willy-nilly from the bottom of the deck, because otherwise we might find that it crumbles down around our ears. Um, so there's the Uruweta case, there's the Kahui case with the Kahui twins, those beautiful little twins who died as the hands of their father or their mother um, a few years ago. With the circle of trust, remember that it's sort of an abhorrent situation where the family and close relatives uh, and friends formed somebody, presumably knew what happened to those twins and why they died, but um, they formed this perverse circle of trust and didn't speak to the police. Uh, so nobody's been convicted of that. The father was tried but acquitted. Um, there's the Antonovich case, or the Jones case it's sometimes referred to, which has been in the media in the last couple of weeks. Actually, in fact, it's, been, it's sort of flown below the, the, the radar a little bit, and you would have heard about this because this was the Nelson low-level drug dealing case. It involved gangs, which, of course, as soon as you use the word gangs, everybody just freaks out and thinks, let's get the military in and shoot all the gangs because they're a big problem in New Zealand. We're not quite as much of a problem as what you and I might on the face of it, think they actually are. You can talk to my colleague, Dr. Jared Gilbert, about that, um, and he'll wax lyrical about how they're not, um, they're not good, but they're not necessarily the, the devil incarnate, uh, and the huge problem in the criminal justice system is what many would have lead, uh, lead us to, to believe. But in the Antonovich case, that involved the police having an undercover cop um, which they do to have undercover um, operatives in, in places around New Zealand all the time. Uh, and they tried to ensconce this undercover um, detective into the gangs by actually having trumped up charges against him and then having him called in the court without the judge knowing that they were trumped up charges and in fact then had search warrants where they forged the signature of the deputy registrar of the court, just bloody outlandish, and then um, they, uh, when, the, when, he didn't, when he didn't appear on the charges, the judge issued an arrest warrant for his arrest all not realising that this was actually all just a figment of the police imagination but in order to be able to endear this person uh, into the um, operative, into the, into the gangs that he was infiltrating. There was a stay of proceedings that was granted by Justice Simon France in the High Court because he said this is so outlandish it taints the evidence that has come as a result of this undercover, uh, undercover operative. The evidence that, they, that that undercover operative gained while in there was in a sense untainted by this previous action. But the court said we, don't, we, we actually care how evidence finally ends up in the court. We actually care about how it has come about uh, 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 has uh, come into existence in the hands of the police and how it's presented. And it's been so tainted by the action of the police, we're actually going to not merely just kick it out, we're going to grant a stay of proceedings. Court of Appeal overturned that um, in a decision that's just all over the show. Uh, and uh, it's a terrible decision, and uh, just simply because of the, the structure of it, if nothing less, and notwithstanding the fact that I don't agree with it. And um, in the last couple of weeks, um, which is good enough reason, isn't it? Um, <laughs> 
back to the patronising, condescending. Anyway, um, and then in the last couple of weeks, they, the lawyers actually t t took a, came at a different angle. They said, look, let's forget about the staff proceedings. Let's just kick it out. Let's apply for it to be kicked out because it's unfair because the way in which it has been gathered. We don't want our police officers who have got a great deal of power and a huge responsibility and do a fine, fine job, but we don't want them actually conducting themselves and their operation, operations in this way. Thin edge of the wedge, you know, floodgates all those sort of um, cliches spring to mind is that if this is how the police conduct themselves, where would the end be? The ends do not necessarily justify the means. So just in the last week or two, um, most of the charges were knocked out. The less serious charges were knocked out against um, the majority, 22 defendants, 14 lawyers um, in the Tonovich case in, in, um, in Nelson. I think there's only eight defendants now um, facing, uh, still facing charges. Um, the McDonald case... We'll talk about um, that case in a bit of detail, actually, in this lecture. Um, but also there's the case that um, is on the other side of the ledger, which I think is, um, just makes my blood boil, is about the police who have charged, well, the Solicitor General, have charged this woman in Rotorua for manslaughter for the death of her baby toddler after she left the child in the car, after rushing to work, forgetting the child was there, but for the grace of God go, go I, um, I think most of us would agree with that, um, uh, and left the child there, come out at the end of the day and the child was dead, right? um, was evidently, understandably, absolutely distraught, um, absolute tragedy. And what have, after quite a considerable, well, reasonable number of weeks, there might even been a couple of months, what have the police done? Charged her with manslaughter, all right? Watch this space, because I've already ranted on TV about this case, and when they discharge her without conviction, and I bet you that's what they will do, because all the other cases in this, um, and I'm taking a punt here, because I don't know all the facts of it, so I'm taking a punt, but I think it's a pretty good one, Every other case that has been anything like that, i.e. the father failing to put the handbrake on when he stops to take a photo of the beautiful lake and the car career careens into the lake drowning the children, or the, those horrific situations where parents occasionally back over their children and kill them, whenever they've been charged with um, manslaughter, um, which in, a, in one perverse sense, in a strict legal sense, is probably their most appropriate charge, in every one of those cases, Discharge without conviction. Where's the justice in that? It's just not that a prosecution not, should not be a bro have been brought. And in fact, I've said that those people who think that whenever bad things happen to good people, that the criminal justice system is the mechanism by which we provide justice or fairness or some sort of resolution, they don't understand what the criminal justice system is about. Because it's not there just merely to right every perceived wrong of anything that bad that happens in, in society. And I think it's a really dangerous precedent for us as society and the police to then pander to that for us, to, for them to necessarily listen to anybody who merely says somebody has to be held accountable in the criminal justice system. That is the wrong, that is a wrong trend and it creates perversities in the criminal justice system that create real problems for us. So, the thesis. There are some, uh, well, are there, I'll phrase this as a question, are there some um, systemic problems in a criminal justice system or is the issue one of unrealistic expectations? Um, do we require a rethink of our system um, or do we just merely need more educated, nuanced um, debate and discussion or could it be both? I think it should be both. I think it's a bit of, bit of everything. Um, yes, we don't have it perfect and yes, there does need to be some, a bit of a rethink in a number of areas. We'll cover some of the things that um, I think that are really pressing as far as systemic issues within the criminal justice system. But undoubtedly, I think that people do have far too much, they have far too much faith in the criminal justice system. They seem to think that it provides divine justice and people get upset and and so they should, I suppose, in a sense, but also it should be tempered with a bit of, a bit of realism. They get really upset when some cases can't provide categorical answers um, where, her again, horrific things have happened to bad people, uh, to, well, sometimes good people, um, this happened to, have, just happened to the, the, the public. You know, we want, we're not happy with the Kahui case. You know? We're not happy with that. We're, most of us are not happy with the McDonald case. Not necessarily because... The case was run badly. It wasn't. Not necessarily because, because there was some stuff up with the police investigation in the McDonald case, which there wasn't, but just merely because it sits uneasy with us, the fact that somebody is dead, having been shot in the throat with a shotgun at the end of his driveway in Fielding, 
and nobody's been held accountable for it. Or two babies are dead and nobody's been able to be um, successfully prosecuted for it. We, that should never sit easy with us, but at the same time, we have to temper that with a bit of realism and know that we don't have divine justice. We don't have a crystal ball within which we can look and say, hey, look, this is exactly what happened. Normally, we have an absolute paucity of facts. We're trying to piece together as best we can after the fact what happened on a particular day. The number one question I always get asked when other people find out what I do is, did David Bain kill his family? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. You know? I'd go so far as to say, I don't care. Ooh, that's even not so many people laughing about that. Why don't I care? I've thought long and hard about that. I've had a bit of an existentialist crisis over why I don't care. It's not that I don't care that five people have been shot and murdered in cold blood. I care very much about that. In fact, my sense of sort of um, justice and indignation over things like that, you know, it, I, um, I feel that very acutely. That's not why I don't, uh, I don't care. I don't care because there is no way upon which I can make a logical um, determination of that. I remember, um, you know, I didn't sit through the case. From my outsider's perspective, there is a plausible argument that he did it. There's a plausible argument that his old man did it, Robin. Right? On that basis, it'll, it, it's difficult to get it beyond reasonable doubt within a criminal trial. As to whether that meant he really did it or did, did not do it, then the, the, we hope that more often than not, our criminal tri trials will give results that equate to what really happened. But we've got no other way of testing that. We've got no other way of assuring that because we don't have a crystal ball. We can just do our best, and I'll step you through how that process works. We can do, have a fair trial, and we can come up more often than not, with the most plausible, probable scenario of events from the facts that we have left over, and we hope that that bears some relation to truth. But sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, the improbable happens. But we don't base our court cases on the improbable. They are all based on degrees of probability. That is the notion of legal logic. It's about probability. But sometimes the improbable happens. The, the people act out of character, which is out of the way that, you know, beyond what they would normally, how they would normally act, um, and could never, not necessarily be predicted. They don't necessarily leave a trail. So we're, we, we find ourselves trying to put things, piece things together in an imperfect world, and we try and come up with resolutions that we think bear some relation to truth, but they don't always, they don't, that, that, that's not always the case. So I do think that people put too much faith in the system. They don't recognise that it's a man-made system and it can't come up with definitive, defined CSI <laughs> Miami or whatever those TV programmes are, are called. They can't, they can't always come up with something definitive. There are some system systemic problems. We're not going to look at um, all of these. In fact, I don't think we're going to look at any of these because we're going to look at some of the acute problems. Access to justice. Uh, well, in the criminal justice system, it shouldn't be called access to justice. It could be exit from justice because once you've been tangled up in the justice system, to get out of the thing is actually requires a huge amount of help. It's like being caught in a whirlpool. You need a whole lot of people to string their arms together to get you out of it. Um, and in fact, if you don't have those people, then you're just sucked around and around and around and around and around and you've got no chance of getting out of it. Um, so access to justice in New Zealand is one of, and it's not just criminal justice, but the family, family courts have been de-lawyering of the family courts, as they call it, and you might think that I would be on the side of lawyers because I'm the dean of law, and I, well, yeah, that I am. Um, but, we, but lawyers actually grease the wheels of the system. You take lawyers out of the system and see how quickly the system gets um, clogged up. Yes, there are some bad apples, as there always are, but more often than not, they're actually there to expedite cases through the system rather than to slow them down. Um, so there's the de-lawyering of the family court. There is the absolute just the travesty of the slashing of legal aid to the extent that you try and find a family court lawyer who will do something on legal aid, which is probably one of the only areas in our justice system that is proactive as opposed to the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, that actually can prevent some issues actually happening as, as opposed to just merely trying to pick up the pieces afterwards. It's just, you know, and you, then you get the community law centres of the country, Christchurch having the biggest one in the country, being inundated with people coming in actually wanting some free advice because they can't get anywhere else about, um, about the family law. So that's a real systemic problem. Um, another one is that the overrepresentation of Māori and Polynesian communities in our criminal justice system. There's absolutely more than 50% of our prison population is Māori and Polynesian. I, I don't care. I, I'll, 
Nobody has any semblance of any rational argument to not say that there is a systemic problem with the overrepresentation of Maori and Polynesian um, communities in our in our. You can't just say, "Oh, they're a warrior race." Rubbish, you know. Rubbish. Look at us white people for for, for heaven's sake. You know, we've conquered the entire world. If that argument applied, it would equally apply to us. We can't just merely say they just need to. Those people over there need to conform to our system. That very argument, which I hear all the time, that very argument proves my point that there's a systemic problem with the with the um, with the with the system of criminal justice that merely is is in a sense at every step of the way is failing these communities. Is failing these communities. Um, Prosecution of sexual offending. I've just been appointed um, to a, um, a group of panel of experts, there's five of us, to have a look at um, the prosecution, the, uh, the complaint, pre-investigation, investigation, investigation uh, laying of the charges, the prosecution, the trial, and then the sentence of sexual offending and to make recommendations to the Minister of Justice for the reform of that. Um, and I can tell you that every step of that process um, is flawed in relation to the prosecution of sexual offending. All right? So it's something like uh, this, the, 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 the experts, the sociologists speculate that there is something like only 20% of the sexual offending that occurs in New Zealand comes to the attention of the police. 80% is unreported. Uh, and many um, victims of sexual offending um, say that it's like being raped again, quote unquote, to go through the criminal justice system. Just outlandish, just horrific. That is unacceptable and it is something that New Zealand and all other jurisdictions in the world have really um, struggled to grapple with. I've, I've said more acute problems. I think they're more isolated, they're more specific. Um, they, are, they can't be called systemic problems, um, but they are problems nonetheless. There's a problem with prosecutorial discretion in this country, um, and uh, there is a problem with prosecutorial discretion in many countries. Don't think that we're looking at these things in isolation. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. One is the woman who's just been charged with, um, with, uh, with manslaughter for the death of her baby. The other is not involving the police, but um, our, our woeful track record of prosecuting health and safety violations in the forestry sector is just... It's just it's outlandish. It's outlandish. We kill close to four times the number of people in our forestry sector than what than Canada, and Canada's industry is six times larger than us. You know, so that's why we at the School of Law are helping prosecutors uh, private prosecution um, against four cases of deaths in the forestry sector where the Ministry of Primary Inter, um, uh, Industries and also the police did their investigations and have failed to bring prosecutions in, in cases where the, uh, well, there just has been no health and safety whatsoever. You know? One involved a man in his 50s with a family who had been working in the forestry industry for 30 years, who at 5 a.m. in the morning had been um, helping loading up logs, um, was skidder driver loading up logs onto a truck um, wearing high vis that could was about as high vis as this suit jacket because it was so old, with no other lighting other than dim lights from the skidder on a 5:30 in the morning in July, and the skidder driver pulled the log up, and when it came into the lights of the log um, lights of the skidder, he thought it saw it was defective. He threw it to one side and killed this gentleman who was standing, didn't know that he was standing at the at the back of the um, trailer. And what did the prosecution authorities do? Nada. Right? Well, not on my watch. I think that's bullshit. You know, I really do. It makes me angry, and it's not going to happen while I have something that I can do about it. Um, case construction. We do have some problems with case construction in New Zealand. More often than not, this is not a problem. But when it when it when it turns sour, it goes really bad. Right? So we just had the Lundy case. How on earth can you have from one trial to the next trial a completely different factual theory? Right? How can that happen? Um, the Scott Watson case. If you believe the critics, there is a fundamental um, problem with the case construction. And I'm going to spend some time on that and t tell you how pr prosecutors should go through. We're the only law school in the country who teach this stuff. And sometimes I doubt prosecutors get it and uh, uh, get this training. But this is how, um, in an ideal world, the Rolls-Royce way of case construction is to go about. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the law of evidence. A lot of people, lawyers are pretty happy with the law of evidence, actually, um, but most people in the public think um, the law of evidence is um, going is the single sort of um, exhibit, exhibit A of why we're going to hell in a handbasket. Why don't we have previous convictions admitted as a matter of course in trials? I'll talk a little bit about that in the context of the McDonald, the McDonald case. Um, 
Uh, and so, you know, why do we have privileges? Why do we have, how does expert testimony, how, what, what's the ins and outs of that, which are other problems I'll come to? Um, why do some cases seem to be a battle of who's got the best expert? Paucity of scientific transparency. Uh, ESR say they're independent, but every other um, forensic scientist I've ever spoken to says the ESR are at the beck and call of the police, and they only actually analyse what the police tell them to as opposed to what the defence tell them to. Um, and so there are real problems. Um, they are acute problems. I'm not going to say the systemic problems, but there are acute problems with um, the, the lack of scientific transparency uh, in New Zealand from the state-funded side of things um, and how that contributes to difficulties that may arise in cases. Because many cases, there's actually nothing wrong with the law. It's just they're built on, on um, shonky foundations. There's something wrong with the science. And so many defence lawyers either have to engage um, scientific experts or become scientific experts themselves to actually see that there's something wrong with the DNA analysis or there's been um, contamination or what have you. Scott Watson case, allegation of contamination there in the, in the lab of the hair that was found um, said to be um, um, Olivia uh, Hope's uh, hair that found on Scott Watson's boat and there was a, a, an allegation of that having been um, a, a dropped on the floor of, uh, of the lab. Scient problems with scientific evidence more generally. Um, we're trying to move to uh, what's called a hot tubbing where all the scientists get together in a courtroom and actually can hear the testimony. This is what actually happened in the Lundy case. They could all hear each other's testimony, had an opportunity to respond to that. Um, not so much in real time and proper hot tubbing is when they're actually all in the room together uh, and they can talk so you don't just sort of get a... Um, a, a separation in time where you get one expert come in and gives all their evidence and another one comes in and then they don't have an opportunity to be able to respond or interact with, with one another. But there are real problems with um, scientific evidence. And the New Zealand police, are they rotten to the core? I hear this so often. People think the New Zealand police, look, and I've given, I do give the police a bit of a hard time. They're not rotten to the core. I firmly believe that. In fact, I don't think there's any... There's any um, a uh, sustainable argument to say that New Zealand police are, are rotten. In fact, my colleague's uh, Professor Greg Newbold says that in the underworld, the great lament of the underworld in New Zealand is that the police are largely immune to bribery. So, um, <laughs> so they don't think they're rotten to the core. Now, you think that if anybody would know, it would be the New Zealand underworld. Um, and, uh, and, and let alone, you know, well, Dr. Jared, Gil Garrett, Jared Gilbert talks about um, blue vision or blue haze, where you might get a collective group think where there is a decision is made too early about who, the, who their man is, more often than not their man, and that there is a construction of cases around that person to the exclusion of, of other scenarios. Yes, yeah, New Zealand police are as prone to that as anybody else is in the context of um, collective thinking, but that does not actually um, mean that New Zealand police are rotten. They most certainly, certainly, certainly aren't. Okay, there are some, for those people who say... Look, Chris, what about the Uruweta case where they blatantly did things wrong? What about the Antonovich case where they went and actually trumped up a, you know, charges and forged signatures and didn't tell the judge and, uh, and in order to be able to ingratiate their man on the inside of uh, the undercover operation? Yeah, well, they are examples of very bad behaviour and we should come down hard on those and thankfully I think the New Zealand courts do as, as evidenced by in the first Antonovich round the stay of proceedings, and in the second, the exclusion of the evidence. So um, they do learn, and in the Uruweta 11, it went down to the Uruweta 4 because most of the evidence was kicked out by the Supreme Court in the case called Hamid. So we're going to have a look at the con case construction and the law of evidence, so the two main things we're going to have a look at tonight, how, do we, how they actually go about it. Case construction. Case construction is all about coming up with a theory of the case, right? So it's all about the theory of the case. And the theory of the case is important because it gives flesh to the bones of the legal case. And in the context of the criminal law, the legal case is always found in statute, right? So we don't have any common law or judge-made crimes in New Zealand. We have judge-made defences under Section 20 of the Crimes Act 1961, but we don't have any judge-made offences. So all of the criminal um, activity in New Zealand is governed by legislation. That's not the case with civil suits, of course. The majority of civil suits uh, and vast majority of civil suits are judge-made, so um, issues of breach of tortious liability and duties of care from lawyers to accountants to doctors to all sorts of different negligence claims. Most of that is all judge-made law. Breach of contract, yeah, there's some legislation around that, but it's, a, it's augmented quite 
um, heavily by judge-made law. Um, but in the case of the criminal law, no, it all revolves around what's in legislation. So you won't find any crimes that are not in legislation in New Zealand. You will in England, but you won't here. So set by legislation, uh, the, the legal case is... The legislation sets out the elements that have to be proved for a case to be successful or for a defence to be established. Now, not all defences are in, uh, in legislation. Um, Section 48 of the Crimes Act, um, self-defence is a good example of a defence that is actually legislated for. It is in legislation. But there are other defences that are not actually in legislation. They are governed by, um, they're governed by uh, judge-made law. But wherever the source of it, this is the legal case of the elements you must prove, you've got to establish. Murder, let's take murder, because most of these cases we've, I've just sprouted on about are murder cases. Um, they're relatively straightforward. You've got to have somebody dead. All right, you've got to have a dead person for murder. You've got to have a dead person. Sometimes that's really hard to prove. All right, the, the Watson trial, that was a really big issue. Do we have two dead people? Question number one, or have they just gone off on holiday and they're going to turn up in a few months time right so you've got to establish that these people are dead if you don't have their body that's a difficulty that's a hurdle that you must surmount if you're ever going to be successful you've got to have a dead person with murder um, you've got to have another person not a corporate entity but another person uh, who's caused that death right so you've got to have two people one dead one alive and you've got to have an issue of causation that the one who's alive did something to the one that's now dead that caused their death, right? It can't be that they um, didn't, the Milner case, you know, they didn't, that she didn't poison, um, poison him, which was the issue on, on appeal, um, and that was trying to get at the issue of that, yes, he had a dead person, yes, he had a live person, but we didn't have causation. Causation wasn't proved. So that was the, that was the, um, that was the issue there. So those are sort of the hard material facts of the issue. You know, you've got a live person, a dead person, you've got causation. You then have what we call the mens rea, which is the mental element. You've either had to, if the person who's alive has had to have caused the other person's death willfully in some, in some way or another. There's a whole lot of ways in which that can happen under New Zealand homicide law because New Zealand's homicide law is a basket case. And needs to, I should put another problem down here. It needs to be thrown out and actually start again because it's rubbish, all right? It's just rubbish. It's so complicated and it's just unnecessarily so. So you, cause, you, you can be convicted of murder if you intend to kill somebody. That's the uh, homicidal maniac who wants to go out and his object and purpose is to kill somebody, all right? They want to do it. You know, turn up at, the, at, the, at your parents' place, knock on the door and you shoot them dead or whatever. I don't know. You, you want to kill the person. You go and execute, excuse the pun, that, um, that, that motive. Sorry, the dark humour is coming through. That, that's what you want to do. That's what you do. Murder. You want to beat the person up. You want to cause them bodily injury. You, you contemplate in your mind that there's a possibility that they might die, but you just discard that, and you just give them a thorough good hiding, and they die. Because you've contemplated the prospect of them dying, you're guilty of murder. But you've got to prove that that person act, not should have turned their mind to it, did turn their mind to it. All right? That's tough. So that's 167. A, willful um, killing, 167B, uh, the causing uh, bodily injury and then reckless as to whether death ensued. That's the second scenario. 167C, transferred malice. You tend to shoot um, that person. They duck and you shoot somebody else. Um, you're still guilty of murder. Um, we transfer the malice that you intended for this person onto the person you did shoot. Or you shoot them and go, yeah, I've got them. You walk up to them and realise, oh, no, it's not the person I thought it was. <laughs> You're still guilty of murder, OK? Even though you go, but, oh, this guy was a nice guy. That's the answer all over there, you know. <laughs> no, 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 that doesn't wash. Um, 167D, if you've, could you have actually done an unlawful act, you've then, again, turned your mind to the possibility of somebody dying. You're burning down a house. You don't intend anybody to die, but you realise it could actually occur and somebody is in the house and they die. You're guilty of murder if you actually have the subjective knowledge uh, and you turn your mind to the fact that somebody could possibly die. All right? So that's murder. And then 1678, that you've willfully stopped the breathing of somebody while you're committing an act or you've stupefied them and you've done a few other things. So 167 a, 167 and 168 is, is murder. That's the legal case. You've got to show these are the elements. Mental element, 
You got a dead person, you got causation, and you got a live person who did it, all right? That's what you've got to prove in order to succeed. Case or factual theory. A theory about what happened, a story that satisfies the elements of a legal case. Once upon a time, there was a man called Julian Assange. This is a um, case that I gave the file to the students a couple of years ago, because you can find it on WikiLeaks. And, um, and uh, if you didn't know who Julian, you've been living in some hillbilly shack somewhere and you didn't know who Julian Assange is, he's the guy who's, um, where is he held up at the moment, actually? Is he in, still in Moscow. Moscow? He's in, no, that's the other guy, isn't it? Yeah. He's in the embassy. He's in London, isn't he? Yeah. Ecuadorian embassy. That's right. Yeah. Um, eating enchiladas every day. I don't know what he's doing, but he's, he's hiding out because he doesn't want to be extradited. Extradited for what? Well, it was molestation charges of two women in Sweden. Now, I gave the, um, I gave the file to the students. I said, now, you've got to come up with your factual theory and you've got to tell me how you're going to prove it. And they come up with their factual theory. And some of them were, once upon a time, there was a man called Julian Assange and he was a bastard. <laughs> I said, this is the only time, students, so you're going to have the opportunity of starting off a law essay with once upon a time and can legitimately use the word bastard. Um, others would say, once upon a time, there was a man called Julian Assange and he was misunderstood. <laughs> Because some of them went with the theory that he actually had done these acts to these women in order to get them pregnant willfully because he knew that Sweden didn't have an extradition agreement with America. And so he, if he got them pregnant, that means he could get, he could get citizenship in Sweden. <laughs> this is going on a bit. Um, citizenship in Sweden, and therefore he couldn't be extradited to the States because he lived in perpetual panic and fear about being extradited, extradited to the United States for all the stuff he'd done with WikiLeaks. Right? That was their... That was half the class's factual theory. All right? The other half just said he's a narcissistic bastard who just didn't give a, two hoots about these women and would just did outlandish things because he just cared about himself. Then they had a whole lot of, I think this is probably closer to the truth, but um, they had a whole lot of facts. You know, he, um, he didn't wash and lived in a, in a when, he went to, when he went to Sweden, the, the facts are on the file. It said he didn't wash. He lived in a little a, a bed, so he stayed in a bed with a woman he didn't know. It was one of the ones he had molested. Um, and he didn't wash and he stunk and he didn't flush the toilet and he never had any money and he was always looking, up and looking himself up on, um, on Google and he was doing all sorts of things with some narcissistic traits. Right? He was, he, by all accounts, from that file, he's an odd guy. Right? This is now going to be on YouTube and he's going to sue me for defamation. But... <laughs> that file looks like he's odd. All right? He's odd. All right? But those people who said he was just trying to, he was misunderstood and he was trying to actually just flee the United States authorities, they just rendered most of that file irrelevant. It couldn't be admitted as evidence. All the stuff about him not flushing the toilet, not washing himself and being narcissistic, all irrelevant. And in fact, if they then tried to adduce that, defence counsel would say, all you're trying to do is sully the reputation of my client in the eyes of the jury, and I object to this because it's not relevant to any of the issues that are in, uh, that, that are in question in this case, because your factual theory is that he's actually just misunderstood. So why are you just trying to paint him as a bastard? But for all those people who said he was a bastard, all the WikiLeaks stuff, well, much of it is irrelevant. Unless you want to show that he's so narcissistic that WikiLeaks is an example of it. But all the extradition stuff, irrelevant. So you've got one case that it's actually relatively straightforward, and you've got two different theories that, are that re will result in entirely different cases being presented. So my point is, is that you might have a case you think is fairly uh, pedestrian, fairly linear, but it can actually result in all sorts of different theories. Because normally you'll have a fact here then you have nothing, you have a fact here, fact here, you have a dead body, then you have a fact, nothing here, and then you have some blood on a shirt, <laughs> supposedly here, and then you have a car that's got um, no gas in it, and then you'll have a fact way back here that he filled it up the day before. Now normally you can actually, you could quite conceivably weave probably four or five different absolutely plausible scenarios, but entirely different from one another, this is just London. Imagine Scott Watson. Scott Watson, there's just massive gaps. You got two young people who go off with somebody and then never seen again. <laughs> and not much more than that. Right? You've got some sloop or catch that's, that's seen by a whole lot of people and then the police say it didn't exist. Right? 
So you've got all of this. How do you weave that into a plausible narrative? You've got to pick one. You can't say to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we've got to prove this case beyond reasonable doubt. And you can trust us that we think it's proven beyond reasonable doubt, but we can't tell you how it happened. <laughs> or I'm going to give you 10 scenarios and you can just pick which one you want. All right? That ain't going to happen. The way the adversarial system works and an inquisitorial system, don't think the inquisitorial system has it all sussed out because it doesn't. It makes you put your eggs in one basket. Very rarely you can say to the jury, ladies and gentlemen the jury, we're not quite sure, quite sure how this particular part panned out. It could have been this or it could have been that, but either way you can be absolutely categorically assured that this is what, that the end result was at the hands of this person. Very rarely can you do that. You might have been able to do it with some aspects of the McDonald case. You and McDonald um, supposedly shot most people. Most people, I think, would say did shoot and got away with it. But um, uh, allegedly uh, and being acquitted of shooting Scott Guy um, at five or so in the morning, called to five in a fielding morning at the end of his driveway, um, and uh, they only had circumstantial evidence. We'll get onto that in a moment. Factual propositions. So you've got your legal case, you've got the elements you've got to prove, and then you've got your factual propositions. And there might be, I've likened it here to a staircase. You've got a factual proposition that builds into another factual proposition to another, 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 until you get ultimately to your main actual arguments. And I'll give you an example of that with the McDonald case in a moment. Factual propositions, if factual propositions are the stairs, they're what you say happened, your conclusions from the facts, then direct and circumstantial evidence are the building blocks. So let's just talk a little bit about what direct and circumstantial evidence is because nobody knows and they all think that they know and everyone gets it wrong. Direct evidence is just merely you've got somebody who says they saw what you're trying to prove. So whatever you're trying to prove, it might be the ultimate case or it might be just one small component of it. It might be that um, you have to place um, uh, person A, uh, who you say killed person B in Wellington on the 21st of February 2015, right? So that's ultimately, you're saying that that's murder. A killed person B in Wellington on the 21st of February 2015. But A lives in Christchurch. So you've got to get A to Wellington. Right? You've got to get them to Wellington, don't you? You've got to prove that they're in Wellington on the 21st of February. Unless they did it by poison, let's say that they bludgeoned them to death. Just because it's gruesome and people like gruesome stuff. Um, okay, they killed them on the 21st of February in Wellington. You've got to get them to Wellington. You might say the person flew to Wellington on the morning of, or the afternoon of the 21st of uh, February. Okay? If you've got somebody who, um, so they flew, there's an aeroplane, all right. Marlborough Boys College, art classes, D. Um, <laughs> flew to Wellington on the, morning, on the morning of the 21st of, or the afternoon of the 21st of February, and you've got the person who's sitting next to them. Your name and, name and uh, address, Chris Gallivan, um, St Albans, Christchurch. Can you tell us about the day in question? Yeah, I was flying to Wellington at uh, 2 o'clock on uh, the 21st of February, and I sat next to this guy. Um, and uh, can you see him in, pri in, in prison? In, in the um, courtroom now? Yeah, that's him sitting right there. Um, DOC identification is always notoriously bad because they're usually the person sitting next to the two prison guards. Um, occasionally, you get to go, the person look around and go, hmm, that person, they point to the judge or something. Everyone's like, what's going on here? Um, anyway, I saw him. I, that's direct evidence. It's direct evidence of the proposition you're trying to establish, that he flew on that plane. It's a good example of a proposition that feeds into a proposition that feeds into that might ultimately get him to Wellington to have, done a, to, to have committed the murder, but you might have proposition that lays over proposition that feeds into another one that's staircasing all the way up into one of the aspects of the legal case, right? So you've got, you've got to start way down here before you even can remotely get to even just getting him in Wellington, let alone plunging the sword in or whatever you say is he's, how he's done it. Direct evidence. What you want to prove, you have direct evidence of it. Circumstantial evidence. You don't have direct evidence. You've just got some evidence of which you can draw an inference. So that's the key. With direct evidence, you don't need to draw any inference. The jury just needs to believe the person who's giving you direct evidence. With circumstantial evidence, they need to, the jury needs to draw an inference. You can't do it as a lawyer, and the, and, the, and the witness can't do it, but the jury, you're inviting them to come to, an, uh, to, to draw an inference. An example. 
flying on the, in the plane on the afternoon of, um, of the 21st of February. You've got no witnesses. Right? Nobody can testify to your man being on that plane. But what they can do is say, I remember him because I saw, oh, you've got one person here, person C, who saw him in Christchurch that morning. Right? On the morning of the 21st. And then you've got somebody, D, who saw him in Wellington at 3 o'clock on that day. So you told the ladies and the jury, we can't actually place some direct, we've got no direct evidence of him being on the plane, but we can tell you that he was in Christchurch in the morning, quite assuredly. We've got a lot of witnesses who say he was in the morning, he gave a lecture. Um, <laughs> don't personalise the examples, that's right. Um, he gave a lecture on the morning of the 21st, but he was also seen in Wellington in a meeting that afternoon at 3pm. So unless he's developed some teleportation device, um, he must have flown from the morning to the afternoon, the only way known to man to get to Wellington from Christchurch at that time is that he flew. You've narrowed it down at least. There's probably five flights that he could have taken. And if it's important that you got him on one particular flight, you're going to have to get some more circumstantial evidence, aren't you? To narrow it, to narrow it, and to narrow it. Because the generalisation you have out here is that people cannot travel that, that length of, uh, that distance in such short a period of time, save for taking an aeroplane. That's the generalisation. If you see, if he was seen in Wellington three days later, then your generalisation is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. But ladies and gentlemen, we have no problem with cases based on circumstantial evidence in the majority of cases. No problem whatsoever. So here we go, oh, but the case against him was circumstantial. It can be powerful, just as powerful as direct evidence. The reality is, is you would have direct evidence, but because you don't know whether that's going to score a home run, you call every bit of evidence you possibly can. You call that he was seen in Christchurch in the morning. You call that he was seen in Wellington in the afternoon. You call the person who sat beside him. You call whatever else you've got because you think, I've got to get it over the mark, and I can't just sort of like say to the jury, you with me? You, you, you're right with that one? Yeah, okay, all right. I won't call the rest of the witnesses because we all agree with that, don't we? You can't, you can't do that. Right. Key attributes of a good, of a good um, factual theory. Consistency with instructions, legal significance, comprehensive. So a good theory is, has evidential support. A support. It's, not a, it's not a conspiracy theory. I said to the students who said that Julian Assange was so scared about being extradited, I said, that might be the truth. But you're making it really hard for yourself. You just now have to jump over a whole lot of hurdles that you probably don't need to. Can't you just call him a bastard? Isn't that the easy one? You've got a whole lot of evidence here that seems to show that he's really odd. Why don't you just go for that one? Not only is your trial going to be about two months shorter, but isn't it just going to be easier to believe? It might not be the truth, but it's the easiest one. And if it's the more probable one, it's more likely to be the truth. Sometimes conspiracy theories are true, but the reason they're conspiracy theories is there's a paucity of evidence to actually say that that is, the, that is what happened. That's why they come to conspiracy theories, right? There is a tantalising amount of evidence towards it, but are not enough to prove it. And if, in a criminal court, if you can't prove it, it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Who cares whether it happened? Because you've got no ability to be able to prove it. Or, you know, you might rest at night and go, oh, well, I know what the truth was. Well, that's cold comfort of murderers walking around. You've got to be able to prove it. It's got to be plausible. It's got to be simple, as simple as you possibly can. No jury can deal with more than about seven different complications and twists and turns. So try and group them into um, propositions that clumps to make it easier, because otherwise you'll lose them. It's got to be consistent with the internally consistent. It's got to be clear. It's got to be flexible. Somebody stands up and says the opposite of what you think they say. You've got to try and roll with that. There's not one of those things, and this is the generally accepted attributes of a good, clear, factual theory. Truth doesn't pay one factor in that. <laughs> Because truth doesn't, if you can't prove it, truth doesn't matter, <coughs> unless you're religious. <laughs> but it doesn't matter in the court, it doesn't matter in criminal, it doesn't matter to, necessarily to the victims if the person is not convicted. Of course, truth always matters to the, to the victim. They're often not around, especially in murder cases, of course, or they've, um, they've had to leave the country or they, uh, they are mentally disturbed to such an extent that, um, that they're unable to engage in it. Um, but otherwise, truth is vitally important. Everyone thinks, is this what it's all about? Well, hopefully it is. If you adhere to these, then you're going to get something that you can actually prove, and hopefully, more often than not, that's going to have a semblance of truth to it. 
Let's have a look at the McDonald case because I want to wind you up a bit more. <laughs> Here's what a mapping of a McDonald case might look like. McDonald intentionally shot, killed his brother, his uh, brother-in-law, Scott Guy. You might say that here are the main factual assertions. That's the legal case at the top. The factual assertions are your main ones. McDonald shot Guy. McDonald intentionally sh uh, killed Guy. There was no suggestion that he just meant to merely. You're, you're putting the eggs in the basket of 167A that he intended to kill him. You're not saying that he meant to rough him up and he accidentally shot him in the throat. You're saying he killed him. That's what he wanted to do. You're not saying that he meant to shoot somebody else and shot him. You're not saying that he wanted to do something else unless you want to say he stole puppies and in the process of that he was holding his brother-in-law. It's just not feasible as a theory. So your theory there really and what the case was put forward, the only one available, was he intentionally killed his brother-in-law. McDonald had the motive to murder Guy because he was the prodigal son who came home and all was forgiven given while Scott Guy, uh, why uh, McDonald had been working the farm for years, married the sister, raised the family, was a brilliant farmer. This um, larrikin um, man about town came from swanning around the world and all was forgiven and he was going to get the farm. So it's biblical. Um, McDonald had the character to murder Guy. He's a nasty piece of work. So those are your main sort of th your arguments, all right? That's what I would say if I was doing that case are the main factual contentions, all right? What about the poaching of the surprise stag from the next door neighbour that was admissible and the killing of the 19 calves that wasn't admissible? All right? Oh, calves. <laughs> Just put that good, good spotting. Where's my gold, where's my gold stars? <laughs> calves. Um, <laughs> Oh gee, now I feel I'm blushing red. You know what I mean. Wound everybody up. Went into his next door neighbour's um, cow shed with a bullpen hammer and knocked these calves on the head. For what reason? Just to get back at the neighbour. Right? If you were the prosecutor, what would you want to do with those, with that evidence? I suggest you might want to do something like this. You'd want to prove that he was capable of committing the crime, poaching the deer, the same with the killing of the calves. Um, nasty piece of work, nasty piece, very nasty piece of work. Can kill an animal and therefore can kill a human. Can bludgeon animals, can therefore kill a human. There's actually some scientific um, uh, sort of, uh, there's some uh, psychological and sociological analysis that shows that those people who are prone to um, cruelty to animals are more likely to commit um, violent acts against uh, humans. Uh, cross him, he'll deal to you. Cross him and he'll go to extraordinary lengths to exact revenge and he's a good hunter. Well, the issue of a good hunter is probably not going to go to character because that'll, go to, that'll be direct proof. Because what's your theory in this case? He hunted Scott Guy, aren't you? That's why all that hunting stuff was admissible. That's why the poaching of the deer was admissible. Because what did he do? He killed the next door neighbour. Okay, it was semi-rural, but there was a few houses around. He killed the next door neighbour's prize stag and got away with it. Right? He got away with it. It's a big animal. So to do that, he must be a really good hunter. If he could do that, he can sneak up to the end of a driveway in the 4.45 in the morning and shoot his brother-in-law and get back and everyone would be none the wiser. It's directly relevant to what you're trying to prove. The rest of it's not directly relevant. It's circumstantial evidence to show that he had the character. He's a bad, nasty piece of work. So if we're going to map that, this is what it might look like. And this is what I get the students to do. <coughs> McDonald had the character to murder Scott Guy, murder Guy, right up the top in the middle. That's one of my main arguments. Right? So this is one part of the argument over two pieces of evidence. Right, so you can see how they you know, end up, you'd have charts all over the show, you'd have a whole wall filled with charts. All the mental mind map before you even go into a hearing. Right? This is mapping out your theory of the case. McDonald had the character to kill Scott Guy. The, what we can group those, what I've just talked about there, a lack of empathy, vindictive and no respect for the law. The generalisation that each of those rely upon, people who lack empathy... Um, uh, are more likely to commit murder or gross acts of violence? Well, yes, but you probably need more than that. People who are vindictive are more likely to commit murder or gross acts of um, violence? Well, yes, but you probably need more than that, so that needs to be conjunctive. You need to be able to show lack of empathy and vindictive. No respect for the law. People who have no respect for the law are more likely to commit murder? No. Objection down the bottom. That generalisation is unsound. Right? It defies the laws of logic. We're all, this is all logic. This is all about non sequiturs and premises and valid lines of reasoning. 
So the only way the respect of law could survive is if you link, link it to vindictive and you link it to a lack of empathy. Because it can't survive by itself, but it might be able to be survive if you say that if you could prove he lacks empathy, he's vindictive and has no respect of the law. All those three together, but only those three together, might be able to show that he had the character to kill and uh, murder Scott Guy. All right? So this is where you go from the theory to actually proving it. And this is where the holes start to come in the, in the argument. But in case, I'm just going to play you one quick, and we're going to finish on this. One quick um, recording. What the jury never heard at David Bain's retrial. It's a small piece of audio, though, edited out of the 111 call that Bain made. The jury never heard it because it was not considered relevant or reliable. But today, the Supreme Court said the material could be made public. Listen for yourself. See if you can make out what the police has said. We're going to play it twice. Right, what did he say? Can you hear anything? <laughs> I shot the prick. Let me play it again. What if anything is said? We're going to play it twice. Oh, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> Not admissible. Do you think that should have been admissible to the jury? Do you think the jury in the David Bain case should have heard this? This is the 111 call. I won't play the whole 111 call. He's very upset. The whole thing is this panting sort of um, loss of breath and sort of come quick, come quick. My, my family are dead. My family are dead. They're all dead. They've been shot. They've, you know, my dead. And you, you would never pick up that. That's played twice and it's slowed down and it's amplified. But the jury didn't get that played to them. Should they have? Why? Those people who say that it should have been, why? Yeah. Yeah. So you would say you would say it shouldn't have been played to the jury. Yeah. You you only hear it once you're primed. And if you're a jury, if you're a jury, you might have actually um, abrogated your responsibility to be certain on that, or at least at least um, beyond reasonable doubt, and say, oh, well, the police think, they've got all the experts, they think it was that, oh, oh, I can't really hear it. Oh, yeah, I can sort of hear it now. The prosecutor says that, well, they're more intelligent, listen to it more, more than I have, so I'll just say, yeah, you know, um, I'll just go with what, what they say. There must be somebody here who says that should have been played to the jury. Yeah? Who? Why? Because I think it's a, a part of form of evidence it's a confession, isn't it? <laughs> I shot the prick. We're trying to get this guy on murder, and all of a sudden we've got something that at least on the Crown... Exactly, it's a piece of evidence. If it's not clear what's being said. Nothing's bloody clear in life. It doesn't come in... A, it doesn't come in... Go and have a look at ESR. It was that brain matter on Lundy's shirt. You know, we've got world experts saying absolutely not. We've got New Zealand experts saying absolutely it was. It doesn't come in neat packages. You know, if this is the, all a mess. If you played the whole thing, the jury wouldn't listen to that. They wouldn't listen. No, They'd be listening to the words. You'd need to draw their attention to it. But oh, surely, you can't do that. But surely drawing their attention to it, they would be then intelligent lay people to make up their own mind? Nah. No. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, I totally agree with you. That wasn't played to the jury and should not have been played to the no. jury. Because they had, um, and but not for necessarily for those reasons. Okay, one was one was that it's pri you know you can only hear it once you're primed. But really, the main reason was that there was about five linguistic experts from around the world who listened to that, and they were the the experts. It wasn't played. It wasn't discovered in the first trial. It was only discovered before the second trial. Right, so even the prosecution didn't even know it was there. Um, but, um, you know, somebody just heard and go, oh, they're playing it down slowly and listening to it and go, hey, do, do you know what, um, excuse me, Detective Sergeant, I think there's a confession on here. Um, but there are, a number of, there are a number of arguments. There were three arguments that were put why that shouldn't be admissible. The first one was the defence said it doesn't conform to the Crown's theory of the case. All right, now, OK, OK, that's, uh, you know, that's a weak argument, and it was rejected by the Supreme Court, and quite rightly so. But I understand where, it's going, where they're going to on that. 
Why did the Crown go with killing all five? Why didn't the Crown go with Robin Bain killing four and him coming home and finding his father and killing uh, Robin? Because they were too greedy. Because they would have made their job inexorably easier. They were five individual counts of murder. They then wouldn't have had to have doubt any of the forensics because you would have all said, yep, absolutely, it was, the, it was Robin. Yep, he went on a murderous rampage and killed the family. He had motive to do it. There's a whole lot of socks and bloods and, uh, and glasses and things left on computers that all support that. Yes, no problem, uh, defence, we agree with you, but we think David come home and lost it having seen his father shot the rest of the family and he shot the father and we've got you on the one murder. Why didn't they go with that? That was a theory that was entirely open to them. But they didn't. They said, no, we're going to throw all the eggs in the basket and we're going to go for five. And then they made the job so much more difficult. Big call, though, isn't it? Big call to go for one and not five. You could have said that it was always open for the jury to acquit on four and convict on one. Right? They could have come up with their own theory. That's a bit unfair on the jury because the case wasn't put to them on that basis. That was argument number one why that wasn't, wasn't relevant. You can see why it failed, but it was a good try in the defence. Judge, this is not, does not conform with the, with the Crown theory. They say it killed all five. Um, this here is a confession to one that, uh, that is, would only support a case that is fundamentally different to what the Crown say. And the, what the Crown say forms the basis upon which we judge whether the evidence is relevant, whether it's direct or circumstantial. Argument number one. Would Argument it be um, murder or manslaughter? Sorry? It, would it be murder or manslaughter? Well, you then would have had to argue, probably would have plea bargained it out for manslaughter. Yeah, would have got a convict. We'd never, wouldn't, wouldn't, never been talking about David Bain ever again, right? <laughs> he wouldn't have got compensation, which he's probably not going to get now. Um, second argument: you only know, you can only hear it where it's primed, and the um, danger is, is that you might abrogate the responsibility you owe as a juror to the fact that these other intelligent men and women have come to the conclusion, and you say, look, I can't really hear it, but they can. I'm just going to go with them. Third argument. <laughs> Third argument is the linguistic experts couldn't, n there wasn't even a split. It wasn't like a Lundy saying some saying it's definitely brain matter, some saying it's definitely not brain matter. Um, all five said, we don't even know if it's speech, let alone whether it's words, that the words, even if, even if it is speech, I don't know if it's those words. And they were the, the experts and they listened to it with all their fancy equipment and they couldn't come to a conclusion. And so one of them said, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like seeing a rabbit in the clouds. It's not really a rabbit. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, it's not actually there, all right? You listen to it hard enough, you think it's there, but it's not a... Um, and so the basis of why of which it was excluded, which every... Look, most you're all, all intelligent now, but all the, at the time when that came out, there was the hue and cry by, by members of the public as saying this is a tra travesty and it should have been included. The reason it wasn't included was there was no rational, logical basis for a jury to come to a conclusion that it was what the prosecution said it was. All they could have done was just, oh, I think so. There was no, and that is irrational. And we don't like irrational decision-making in law. We don't, it's just speculation. It's just pure speculation. We try and objectify the subjective. We try and strip all that out and come up with bare facts of which we can draw logical inferences that are not non sequiturs on premises that we can agree with or to a high probability agree with, um, and then draw conclusions that are as sound as we possibly can, and that will, could have only been a fundamentally flawed um, basis upon which the jury to draw that conclusion. So it's out. Right. Um, can I just ask? Yeah, so well, it's questions now, actually. So yeah. yeah, no, no, so you can go, go for it. Does a judge have a role No, not in the not. No, well, yeah, that's not without hearing the whole case over again. <laughs> so no, a very good question though. In um, in inquisitorial systems, the judge a uh, judge is, is assigned to the prosecution to help the prosecution um, in um, in the guidance. They give guidance as to, to to the investigation stage. What, it, what that does do, which is of benefit, is that it limits the opportunity because it has an outside objective person, namely the judge. It limits the opportunity, say, in the Scott Watson 
case, the, the criticism of the police is they, they reached the conclusion of who their man was too early and then they constructed the theory of the case and their investigation around that. Because the way you come up with the theory is that you try and get all your facts together and once you've got all the facts, you then try and work out what different theories they are. But the reality is you're doing that on the fly. And it's very difficult sometimes the police might go, oh, look, they follow a lead, for them to say, no, that's actually a dead end, and then come back. And you usually get committed to a theory, which might not be the best theory, or it might not even be a sound theory. With the admissibility of evidence, because much of this, this argument that happened before the trial, for example, with the Bain case, the judge doesn't know the theory. In fact, the judge doesn't even know what other evidence is going to be called. So the judge has often got to make a decision on whether, um, it, whether evidence is admissible with only hearing the argument on the admissibility of that one piece of evidence. And if there's a jury, the test that the judge applies for admissibility is, could a reasonable jury give that some weight? So a judge, he or she, does not have to be convinced that it's absolutely reliable. They don't have to be convinced that it's really, really, really important. They just have to say that there's a semblance of rely reliability, um, it could be important, and a jury, when weighing it up, might give it some importance. They might not but they might. And if they can, then it's in. If they can't, if it's, not, if it's so unreliable, like the 111 call, or um, it's so obviously unrelated, it's not relevant, then the judge will say it's not admissible. So with the killing of the 19 calves, you might say, yeah, look, it does show that this person is a nasty piece of work. The problem is, as soon as you hear that he's killed 19 calves, you're probably going to be so against him and so, um, so um, grossed out by this notion of this monster who's done this, evidently for those of you who are in the farming trade, you probably know that killing calves with a bullpen hammer is actually an acceptable way of killing. It can be very quick. Um, so it's not necessarily inhumane in and of itself. The fact that he had no cause to do it means it's probably um, inhumane. But on that basis, it would say, look, its probative value, its weight, its benefit, its relevance, is, there is some relevance, but it's so minute that it's likely to be outweighed by the illegitimate prejudice. Jury's going to go, oh, this person's been convicted of a rape before? Oh, they must be guilty of this one, you know, as opposed to actually having some similarity. This is not a, this is not a judgment of moral character of the person, but it is to the extent that that moral character is relevant to proving the individual case um, before the court, but not just merely a general, um, you know, whether this person is a, is a good person or not.